Center for Child Counseling is honored to open Leap to Fight 2023 Part 3 with our special guest, Fritzi Horstman, filmmaker, founder, and executive director of the Compassion Prison Project. We'd like to take a moment to thank our series sponsors who made the 2023 Leap to Fight events possible. Champion sponsors, the Haley Foundation, Hanley Foundation, Love Light Foundation, the Breakers Hotel Palm Beach, WPTV News and Ashley Glass, and the many partners and friends who supported each important event. On behalf of the Center for Child Counseling Board, staff, and supporters, we extend you a very warm welcome this evening. Thank you for joining Lead the Fight 2023 Part 3, the last in our series this year. We hope the events were informative, eye-opening, and moving, inspiring you to take up action in the fight against adverse childhood experiences within your own community, wherever you are. It's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed MC and moderator today, a great leader and friend of Center for Child Counseling and the chair of our board of directors, Dr. Eugenia Millinder. Dr. Millinder is a psychiatric nurse practitioner who is currently an associate professor and graduate coordinator within the Psychiatric Mental Health NP Certificate Program at Florida State University College of Nursing. She is also the CAM founder and co-director of the Center of Population Sciences of Health Equity. Her areas of expertise include stress, trauma, and diabetes that is often expressed among minority groups on their underserved populations in the United States. Work with vulnerable populations has taken Dr. Millinder to Haiti, Panama, and Peru, where she and others provided comprehensive healthcare for individuals and communities. We are so fortunate that she brings her wealth of experience and passion to our organization and the world. Please help me welcome Dr. Eugenia Millinder. Thank you so much for the wonderful warm welcome. I am Eugenia Millinder, and I am so happy to be here uh, with all of you guys to talk a little bit about this very special topic that I have to say that is very personal to me. Um, I think that many of us have somehow been touched by individuals either um, you know, in jail or prisons. Uh, personally for me, um, one of my children um, has been and is currently involved in the system. So sometimes where individuals look at you and say, oh, you're doing this work and, and you are doing so well, you can possibly experience this yourself, but well, we do. Um, and sometimes our own traumas from our own childhood is transmitted to your own children and you don't know how this happens. And sometimes I find myself always thinking about, you know, wow, can have this been prevented? Um, can this have been done differently? So you have not transmitted certain things to your children. But that is the same thing that brings me to this work that I do every single day. Um, I personally love the work that I do because I do see myself and see my children in a lot of our own individual clients and faces. And I think that's the best thing we could possibly do because if you are bringing and taking care of individuals the way you want to be taken care of or the way you want individuals to take care of your children, you will do the best for every single individual. You, you will no longer see some of the things they have done as the only reason how you judge them. So we hopefully one day we stop judging individuals, start looking deep into who they are as a human beings, be more human centric versus just judgmental. Um, I have been with the CFC, C, CFCC for my goodness, since it started um, with Renee, since I want to say 10 years now, and it goes back again to the, to the work that I do. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the many organizations that have always focused on trauma. Um, I'm, I am a first generation immigrant, came to the United States, um, learned English as a second language, uh, have multiple traumas in my own life as a child coming here to the United States, um, domestic violence. So guess what? I, I transitioned from a bedside experience of trauma ICU to a psychic mental health, um, not only a practitioner, but a researcher. 
I truly live uh, in practice and I teach and I research mental health, stress and trauma because we have to take this very seriously if we want to make sure that our children in the future um, have a chance. So I'm so, so happy to be here with you guys. One of the things that we also want to talk about is, you know, how is this impacting Palm Beach County? Um, in 2022, Palm Beach County, um, there were 44,000, a little bit over 44,000 arrests in Palm Beach County. Um, a little bit over 1,100 of those arrests resulted in actual admission to the Florida Department of Corrections. Palm Beach County is seventh out of 67 in Florida of the counties when it comes down to the number of admissions to the correction system. Again, also 11, almost 1,100 individuals now were only released, but then were readmitted to the correction system. And out of those 31 were youth um, that were admitted to DJJ. So as a nurse, and I have to always connect it to what we're doing in policy, there's always has been a thing about readmission to hospital. So people have always been talking about, oh, what can you do to prevent a readmission to a hospital? Well, this is the same thing we have to do to prevent readmissions to the correction system. What can we do to provide interventions early on to make sure we prevent those things moving forward? Um, one of my uh, private practice is looking in specifically what I call concierge services to vulnerable populations that are entry, re-entry from prison or the jail, homeless populations, because I believe that any individual requires the same kind of care than anyone that has money. So we have VIP treatments, concierge treatments for individuals that have money. Well, I want to do the same thing for individuals that do not have money, get the same quality care, um, same concierge services. And guess what? What I'm seeing over 12 years that I've been doing this is that individuals say often do not trust the system. They often will not get the care of mental health services because they have mistreated abuse within the system. When you give them a little bit of love and hope, they open up, they become transparent, and they're actually very open and willing to receive treatment. So with that say, I want to introduce you to a little video for you guys to see just a little bit about how we are connected to Palm Beach County and the correction system. Hi, my name is Anne Marie Brown, and I'm the Director of Trauma Services at Center for Child Counseling. I wanted to take a moment and talk about some of the work that we are doing with our criminal justice system, specifically our work with the Department of Juvenile Justice and children who have criminal charges. So sometimes what we do is legal aid will reach out to us and they will ask us to come and essentially advocate on behalf of a child. So I will go out to our local detention center and meet with a child who is incarcerated. It may be a child under the age of 18, or it may be a child who has just aged out of the system or a child who has just turned 18 or 19. I will spend time with that child, conduct assessments with that child, and really learn what this child has been through throughout their life. Then I will provide an expert witness and testimony if needed in the courtroom, discussing the child's history and mitigating factors such as adverse childhood experiences and traumas that they have experienced. I will provide information, psychoeducation to the judge and to everyone in the courtroom that discusses the impact of childhood trauma on brain development and subsequent behavior in the hopes that the judicial system will consider the impact of trauma on a child's behavior and the reason that the child is in this position to begin with. My name is Stephanie Gajri. I'm an assistant public defender here in the 15th Judicial Circuit, which covers all of Palm Beach County. I am presently an assistant public defender that handles um, first degree murder cases. Um, I've been working here for close to 11 years. Um, I would say, um, if not all of them, um, I have throughout uh, my career have learned a lot about the ACEs, the adverse childhood um, um, events. And I have learned that, you know, sometimes just moving around a lot, encountering homelessness, 
or um, just being incarcerated presents its own level of trauma within an individual. So I think a majority of the clients I've represented throughout the years have um, experienced um, either a, a specific traumatic event or sometimes complex trauma, which um, goes throughout their, their childhood, various events that took place that have had an impact on It's, I think it's sometimes it, it's kind of twofold. Um, I do think um, courts are open to hearing about uh, various traumas um, that children have endured, um, especially with the juvenile population. Um, in terms of when I work with and still kind of have um, a few juvenile clients that are charged in adult court, I think it is a newer area um, because of the sciences that are coming out on the juvenile brain. So it's, it's ever evolving for judges. I think, again, I think it really uh, is about training and understanding what it is. And I also think, um, you know, there is always sometimes individuals that feel like, well, I went through this and I'm fine. That understanding that trauma affects each individual person differently. Um, and I always think, especially with juveniles, um, if you have negative peer influences, um, how that can um, af further affect the trauma that you've been through versus having the positive reinforcement, having the resources to kind of wrap around you to help you, um, one, identify those things that are in your life that um, have been traumatic to you, um, and also providing you the resources to actually help you through those. There you go, we mute, thank you. So I just wanna make sure that we take a moment to center ourselves and put ourselves potentially in the situation of being the parent, the sister, the cousin, the neighbor, um, the longtime cousin, cousin, cousin of somebody who has been incarcerated. Because it is in that way that we start looking at the individuals as human beings instead of victims um, of what we call stigma injustice and start doing and looking at things completely different and looking at solutions. So as we get ready to um, welcome our wonderful guests in just a moment, let's recognize that April is a re-entry month, a perfect time to learn about and understand the lived trauma of incarcerated citizens. So we one day welcome them back. Hopefully we're doing that now, as many of us are doing, but we really want to make this um, a community effort. Uh, with compassion and desire to help them be able successful individuals. Next month is, is May and it's Mental Health Awareness Month, a time just as vital and important to share and support the science of brain and emotional development and mental health solutions. So let's always be positive and start looking for solutions uh, for all the diff difficult things that we are experiencing every single day. Before we meet um, Fritzy Hosman, I love this video. I love this video because it puts me in the middle. And to me, that is when we become humble and, and we become grounded in the things that we do and let us really see things through a different lens and be more proactive versus reactive. So um, she's go she did a video in 2020 where she shared Step Inside the Circle at California State Prison in Los Angeles County with 235 incarcerated men. Since its release, the video has reached nearly 3.5 million views worldwide and attracted over 900 volunteers to the Compassion Prison Project. In this excerpt, you will witness and feel her empowering approach to helping imprisoned people recognize the story without shame, embrace their humanity, and claim their healing. Let's take a look together.
It's time now, everyone. We're going to do the compassion trauma circle. Is everyone ready to face their past with compassion? Is that a yes? While you were growing up, during your first 18 years of life, if a parent or other adult in the household often or very often would swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or threw something at you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured, step inside the circle. If you often felt that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, step inside the circle. If your family lived in extreme poverty, step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Good to see you. How are you? you amen. Noel. Noel, good to see you. Honey. Welcome. I was abused as a young girl. I was beaten by my mother. I was verbally abused by my mother. I was sexually abused by another man. My father was an alcoholic. My mother was a rageaholic. I've driven drunk. I've sold drugs. I was a juvenile delinquent. Probably my story is similar to most of your stories in here. I'm white and I'm female and I didn't, nothing happened to me. So, you know, I got a get out of jail free card. And so I'm here now because I see myself in every one of you. I'm a traumatized child, raised by a traumatized child. My mother was traumatized as well as her parents. Like he said, we wasn't born in the world of being evil people. My mother didn't want me. She hid her pregnancy. She tried to flush me down the toilet. But as I learned about these things, I always asked myself what was wrong with me. When I come to the circle and I see everybody else and she's reading off the questions and people step in even further, and I look at my childhood and I'm like, a lot of these people in this yard are just like me. There was one step I should have taken that I didn't take and I saw some of my brothers and my friends take that step and I felt like such a coward you know I wasn't brave enough to be there with them when they took that step and um, every round after that I, I took the most difficult step. Our traumas kept us separated we were all on the circumference all standing apart but once we began to acknowledge our traumas publicly it brought us all closer together in prison, you're not supposed to show your weaknesses in prison, though. No. But to, 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 to want to do that, to walk in that circle like that, and to take each step forward was a reminder to ourselves that we still have a humanity and we're worthy to be loved, though. Most people on the outside don't understand that we want to change so we can re-enter society better than what we left it. And I think one of the things that when you was yelling at no shame, and you had us yelling it out, it was freeing us too. And it was a point to where when I was looking at that and we was all looking at it, in a circle you can hear that echo, no shame. Yes. And that was very powerful, especially coming from a little lady like you. <laughs> I'm 76 years old, I have seen a lot. I don't like talking. I like to meet people that understand what's happening without words and you one of them. Today has been one of the best days I had in my whole entire life.
Your true spirits are not violent. Your true spirits are magnificent. Thank you. Very emotional, very touching, but I am so happy it does that because sometimes it allows us to see um, things that normally we would not see every single day. Frisner Hosmer is the founder and executive director of the Compassion Prison Project and an organization dedicated to creating trauma-informed prisons and communities, bringing accountability and creating inspiration to all men and women living and working in prisons. With 95% of incarcerated men and women eventually returning home, Frisi believes it is imperative that we address chronic mental issues in prison with common sense, compassion, and urgency. Frisi will receive a Bachelor of Arts in Film and English from Vassar College before going to produce HBO's The Defying Ones, which garnished several awards, including a, a Grammy for Best Music Film. Her first feature, Take a Number, which she wrote, produced, and directed, premiered on HBO. Fritzy and team have recently produced their 14 part series entitled Trauma Talks, which is to be distributed to prison in the United States and abroad. The series is endorsed by the former California Surgeon General and ACE pioneer, Dr. Nadine Brooke Harris. Please join me now in welcoming our very special guest, Ms. Fritzy Hoffman. Thank you so much, Dr. Melinder. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for what you said earlier. Um, one of the things that, um, that came up for me was you said, you know, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to piggyback off of it. We're judged for what we do in the world. You know, what's your, what's your occupation? Who are you? You know, what college did you go to, right? We're all judged for what we do and we're not judged for who we are. And I believe that it is in this shift, the shift from our, our doing to our being that our whole world is going to change. And, um, you know, I don't have to be any, I don't have to do anything to be loved or valued. I look at a little baby when they come out, come out, they're perfect, right? Why do we ever change from that moment? Why does that little baby have to prove themselves to be valuable in the world? And so when I think about prisons and when I, when I walk into prisons, what happens is I start seeing people for who they are, not for what they've done. Because if you look at what they've done, you know, you, you recoil. But when you look at who they are, you see their magnificence. And I like to remind them and right now to remind you that we're all divine humans. We are divine humans, first, foremost, actually only. We're divine humans and there are no subcategories. We're not, we're not divine and black. We're not divine and white. We're not divine and female or male. We're just divine. And, and so I want you to remember that always. And that's what I tell the men. And I say men because 95% of the people in prison are men and, um, I've only gotten the opportunity to work with men in the past three years, four years. So I'll just say men, but know that I also mean women. And all of you are, all of you men and women are divine and there are no subcategories. So when you go into the world and you look at people and you judge them for what they're doing, right? Someone's homeless, someone's a drug addict, someone's a CEO, but we're not judging them for who they are. We're judging them for what they're doing, right? And so I think that's, that's where we really start to start thinking, why are we judging this person for what they're doing? Because it, that, that's not who they are. And um, so there are a couple of questions from Step Inside the Circle. So I'm gonna just get into a couple of them before we, we go into, we launch into my talk. But, and I also wanna um, lead you through the circle a little bit, like, because what you see in the film has evolved since, since we filmed that uh, three years ago. Um, one person said, how do we build a trauma-informed system at all levels? And this is, I think this is the thing I, I really want to, you know, um, Gandhi says, be the change you want to see in the world, right? So if you want a trauma-informed system, we have to become trauma-informed. And 
I, I know all of us today are, are trauma-informed and we are becoming trauma-informed. Um, but it's really about us acting in that way and becoming that way. And then, then it, it just automatically shifts. I think we want the world to change, but are we really changing in ourselves? Um, you know, I notice with my husband and my child every day is a chance for me to show who I am in, in the world, how I am being in the world. Am I being a loving mother? Am I being a loving wife? Or am I being, you know, aggravated and disruptive and critical? And it's that, it's that awareness of our behavior that really allows it to change. So another, so, you know, trauma-informed systems at all levels, we have to love everybody and all the things that they're doing at all times. We can't not necessarily approve them, but we have to love them. And it's, it's when we start finding, we start picking at them or being righteous about something that the whole, the whole shift crumbles. We, we are not shifting when we are right about something. We are shifting when we are understanding and loving it. Does that make sense? I, I, I it's like, I don't have any, any, feedback loop here. So I'm just going to keep talking. Um, another question is, why do some people get past life traumas and some struggle and uh, end up incarcerated? Um, you know, I, I think this is a karma question. I'm not really sure. But I, uh, what I say to the men in prison, I say, you know why you're in prison? Because you're in prison. Because in this present moment, are you a criminal? Now, I'm not, please understand, I really want you to know that I enforce accountability. I enforce um, the damage that has been done. So we are we are one hundred percent on accountability. But if I if I am held accountable, uh, if I am being punished for everything I've done in the past, I can't move forward. Right? We can't move forward if we're just dragging this thousand pound weight behind us. So you know, it's not that I'm giving them a hail mary pass. That I'm just saying, look you did something horrendous and you're in prison for it. But the reason you're in prison now, it's not because you're a bad person, it's because you're in prison. There's something in prison that you need to be doing. You either need to be continuing to work on yourself. You know, a lot of these guys are ready to go home. I mean, so many men are ready to go home, but they're still in prison. And so they're like, why am I still here? It's like, we don't know. Maybe it's because you need to change another person's life. Maybe you're gonna save someone's life. So, you know, I. I try to take their victimhood out of the equation to give them empowerment so that they can start saying, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I know I'm changing lives here and there. I'll get the next parole date. And it really shifts, um, shifts how they are about themselves in prison. Um, people end up incarcerated, I think, because a lot of people need a timeout. Um, they're doing things that are, are violent, are destructive and, um, I think we, we need a place for people to go for a timeout. I don't think they need to be prisons. I don't think they need to be punitive. And there are some people that need to stay in, in a secure facility where they can't hurt people anymore. Some people just can't get over the trauma and the violence that, they, they were, that they've endured as children. And we're talking on so many, for so many people, some really horrendous, horrendous acts that have been perpetrated against them. So remember, they're all victims first. Um, we surveyed three, uh, well, I'll get into the surveys later, but 98% of the people in prison have at least one childhood experience, adverse childhood experience. And if you add our supplemental adverse childhood experiences, that's 100%. It's like we add racism and being in the foster care, um, being in juvenile justice system, being having traumatic brain injury. Um, oh, it's right here. Um, seeing, living in a violent neighborhood. Right, you like imagine not being able to walk home and feel safe. So this is all about safety and the brain. This is all about and chaos, right? And being stressed out um, because who can who can make good decisions if you call that a decision um, if they're stressed out ninety you know ninety nine percent of their lives. Um, another question: Children need consequences if they engage in illegal activity. Activity we need to hold them accountable or they will do it again. Isn't addressing trauma, using it as an excuse and encouraging them to do it again? At what point are we allowing excuses for bad behavior? Where's the line? What about consequences? So consequences, um, 
I'm I'm under the I'm under the, in, the my sense is that if punishment worked, there would be no prisons because most of the children have, that have ended up in prison were all punished, were all destroyed. They were physically abused, emotionally abused, um, sexually abused, neglected, um, told they were nothing. So that's punishment. They've already been punishment punished. So violence. Uh, for a violent act doesn't work. The only thing that works is love. The only the only thing that changes anything is love. And, you know, we're not condoning it. But the question is, is why do people that live in at more affluent areas have less people that go to prison? One, I'm sure there's some corruption and they can buy themselves out. Okay, but a lot of it is there's less stress in the household. There's less violence in the household. So the brains are able to uh, recalibrate and make better decisions in those fight or flight moments. Um, so I would say we have to hold everyone accountable. I'm trying to hold my son accountable for getting out of the house and, and not making his, um, his carpool late. I don't know how to do it. I'm not going to hurt him. Um, but eventually, you know, there will be, he'll, he's going to get a tardy, you know. I, I don't know, but when they say spoil the rod, um, harm the, ch the, the, the rod thing, you know, we have to not use the rod anymore. We have to find other ways to, to educate our children about, about behaving because um, we're damaging their brains. Child abuse or child correction, correction damages a child's brain because you're not seeing the child as a human. They really need to be seen for their the divine human that they are. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Thank you so much. I, <laughs> I get that. Yes. So I think we need to spare the rod and educate the child and, and flourish the child because what I see and what I know in prisons and on the homeless men, the homeless people and the drug addicts, they've all had the rod. They've all been destroyed emotionally and physically. And violence is no longer a solution. Violence has been a solution since our nation was founded. Violence has been a solution for centuries, centuries and centuries. Um, the thing that it does is it destroys our brains and it creates, it creates people that go to violence as a solution. Um, my whole, uh, we have a whole episode on violence and um, I really got to understand the violence that's in, in this level four prison that I was in, these men, um, these men, they, they were called that we were, we were having our class and they, they didn't make count. There was one person missing. So everybody had to go back into their cells. Um, well, as the guys were going, they said, we're not going to come back. And so suddenly they just started stealing snacks and pens from us. And what happened was I got to see, I got a glimpse and it was such a great thing for me to see was that violence was a solution for them, for their problem. They couldn't, they couldn't deal with the disappointment of what was about to happen. But what, and so what it did, it was a great thing for me to see that they need, they need hope right now. Those men in the level, level four is a level four prison in California. They're in their cells 23 hours a day. Um, they're out for showers. They're out for maybe yard for an hour, maybe two, maybe for education. But the majority of their time, they're in their cells. So they have no hope. They have no um, serve in return. So this is what parents do. Uh, regulated healthy parents that aren't in chaos and i i have to say i was i have given my son two aces i've given him an emotional abuse and emotional neglect um when i was when i was raising him i did what my mother did i would yell at him for you know creating chaos for me and i would you know and i then i would be depressed about my behavior so i go and ignore him and I'm aware of this now. And if I had only known, I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. If I had known about what I know now, my son would not have any aces. But remember, there's that kutsugi, that kutsugi, it's that, that pottery that's shattered and then it's brought together with gold. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing here. We're rebuilding our lives with the trauma that we've endured with gold through awareness, through self-love, through self-care. Um, and, and so I'm, I have 
the most important thing we can do to our children after we've harmed them is to make that repair is to say, I'm sorry. And that's not, if it's possible, it's not going to happen again. And we're not taking any parents out. You know, parents are doing the best that they can. Um, but it's really important that we continue always to see the magnificence in our children, how beautiful they are, and to remind them how glorious they are. I mean, yes, let them have a big ego. My son, he says, I know I'm great and good, good. I'm doing my job. Um, but to destroy the little, the nuggets of hope and nuggets of self-respect and self-esteem, that's destroying our, our society. That's destroying humanity. And that's what leads people to prison, to addiction, to homelessness, you know, to underachieving. Um, so let me see if there's any, a couple more questions and then, um, what is your take on racism Ugh, and oppression to communities of color and school to jail? It's trauma to jail pipeline. It's not school to jail, it's trauma to pipeline. And the jail industrial, prison industrial complex, I think that for most people who are in jail, it's not about healing trauma necessarily, but rather living in a society that denies the harm that, that, that's been done to them. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, racism is the denial of a person's innate existence. Racism is disgusting and, 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 and horrendous. How can, we, how can we look at a person and judge them on how they came out, you know, just the way they came out? Unacceptable. Um, remember, racism is a trauma response. And I'm not, I'm not justifying racism, but when pe people don't, when they don't feel good, they're looking for something outside of them to blame. And so they will take it out. And this happens in prisons too. This has happened to the people that are living there. They feel awful about themselves. So they're gonna blame it on another gang. This is, what, this is what violence does. Violence and trauma looks for an excuse for our rage. And what happens is that's why, that's why awareness is so important. And a, awareness coupled with compassion because you know it's not what, what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. And this is why, this is why when I read The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk, my life changed because I knew that my behavior was not who I was. My road rage, my inability to compassionately parent my son, my inability to be an extraordinary wife, um, be a good friend all the time, all had to do with having eight aces as a child. And um, so I'm gonna run through a few questions just for you because I. I'm going to get to my little my little program in a minute but you know I just want so if you want it we'll do the top 10 aces um keep track for yourselves and if you you know you don't have to do it just keep track if you know what your aces are great but this is what these are some of the things I say to the guys which which I've developed in the past two three years um to really kind of bring them bring them out and bring them home um, so they really understand what happened to them as a child. So I'm going to read the first question. Before your 18th birthday, if a parent or other adult in the household often or very often would swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid you might be physically hurt, step inside the circle. So if you took that step, and maybe in the chat, let's just do this, in the chat, if you can, whether or not this is true for you, what does a child what does a child feel when he's being humiliated? What does he think to himself? What are the things that he says to himself um, when his mother's swearing at you? Worthless, exactly, Jill, not loved. Keep going, let's, let's get some more of these comments in. I'm not good enough, shame. So there you go, ashamed, pain, hopelessness, hopeless. And these are the exact comments that come from the men. What's wrong with me? Why don't, rejected, lost hurt, unloved, right? So this is, I don't matter, right? These are the, this is a three-year-old, right? A disappointment, unwanted. A three-year-old, I don't belong. A five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old. What 10-year-old doesn't belong? What three-year-old is a disappointment? What human is a disappointment? And then we want to punish people, but this is what, this is what, violent 
verbal abuse. This is what emotional scared. This is what emotional abuse does to a child, but it does it to our brains. And remember, when you're being criticized or being put down or humiliated, our body thinks that this is a tiger attacking it. We are responding in a way that makes us in, that puts us into fight or flight. And this is all day long, every day with everybody. So um, now we're in a prison, right? And a, an officer gets, gets put down, he gets humil humiliated, right? Or the officer humiliates somebody. Basically a tiger's attacking, there's an attack, a tiger attack, right? Halani just says, even now I always think others are attacking me. Exactly, because now you've got toxic stress. Now you don't even know if someone compliments you, if, if that's a true compliment. So this is, this is when awareness has to happen. And this is when we take our deep breaths. Let's all take a deep breath because we've been through something right now. Just in, in through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your nose out through your mouth. This is um, soft belly breathing that um, James Gordon recommends. He's going to be on my podcast soon. So I highly recommend you get his book, Transforming Trauma. It's like a, um, and how to transform your trauma. Um, and let's do it one more time. In through your nose, out through your mouth. So now, when we start criticizing people, or we want, or when we have, you know, I, I had it today. I already I went into my my judgment, my judgy, Judy judgy uh, space because I felt attacked, so I judged, right? So, but we just have to keep being aware and just repeating this awareness to ourselves, so that we're not, you know, don't take yourself out for it. Just, you know, tell yourself, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, you had that feeling," and reset here. Um, Tara says the messages we react to physically are the ones we believe exactly and this is this is the work we have in front of us now and every interaction with every human every thought is an opportunity to heal and to re-examine your relationship with the world um, I'm going to do one more because you, you I, I think you guys really got this but we'll do one more um, we'll do the, the physical abuse uh, no, there, here's one, let's do this one. If you often or very often felt that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other or support each other, step inside the circle. So my question is, is like who here isn't special? Who here of these, how many 102 magnificent humans aren't special? And the answer is zero. There is not one person here that isn't special. And there's not one person here that doesn't matter and that doesn't have something enormous to contribute to the world. And so, and we believe these, because we've been traumatized, because we haven't been told we're important or special, we're looking out to the world. We ask the world to verify, yes, you're special. Yes, you're important. So we, it's with money, it's with sneakers, it's with gold chains, it's with um, rockets, right? How big of a rocket does a person need to know that they're special? Um, sorry, just Bezos, I don't mean to take you out, but we need that money um, for, our, for our children that are, that are starving. Um, I hope I didn't take him out too badly. Anyway, excuse me if you think, <laughs> you know how I it can it, see it's nonstop. Um, Okay, so let's get to the, let me, let me get, let me share the screen. Let's get to our, let's just get to our, uh, our presentation because I'm almost, we're almost halfway out here um, or further. So, so our, our, um, our mission is to create trauma-informed prisons and communities. And this is at, this is at Salinas Valley State Prison. It's a level two and a level, th a level three and a level four. This is a, a level four group, okay? And they've been through it. And they were out for the day with me. But when I got there, they were, I don't know if this was the day, but one of those days, um, I was supposed to have 85 people to work with and 17 showed up. And this is also what's happening with the staff. So we're, we have to deal with the staff and we have to deal Deal with the we have to deal with this dysfunction of the staff because they're so traumatized as well. But um, 
you know, these guys had a day out of their cell. So to me, that's a win. So the problem. It may be hard to believe, but the three largest mental health facilities in the US are uh, the New York City, Rikers Island, the Cook County Jail in Chicago, and LA County Jail. And um, Dr. Bruce Perry says that prisons are mental health centers. We just we just haven't we just haven't shifted. We haven't made that shift yet. But we're doing we're on our way. Um, according to the bureau, oops, sorry, I had to move. I have to move this panel here. According to a Bureau of Justice Statistics report, approximately 74% of state uh, prisoners, 63% of federal prisoners, and 76% of jail inmates met the criteria for a mental health disorder. Up to 80% of the men and women in prison have traumatic brain injuries that impact their ability to stabilize their mental and emotional states. That number goes up to 97% in women uh, and some women because they, they're choked, they've been choked and that creates anoxia. So that's um, their brains don't get enough oxygen. And so they have another traumatic brain injury. And we're, we have, um, we're working with Kim Gorgans in, in, uh, in Denver, in Colorado, um, to bring the men and women ways to get their, get, get their plasticity back in action so that they can start, you know, getting their brain active. We also want to bring in um, hyperbaric chambers and, um, and neural feedback and EMDR and movement and theater and yoga and therapy. These are all from, these are all tried and true uh, trauma, trauma solutions. So adverse childhood experiences, as we've just done, um, I'll just go through them. You know what they are, but um, you know, household member ever been incarcerated? When I bring up that question, you know, it's like, guys, if you have kids, your kids have an ACE. So what we're doing is we're creating awareness that what you've done and the parenting that you've done is creating more ACEs. And, you know, we, I plant the seeds on what can we do to stop these ACEs? So to me, you know, prisons are, you know, ground zero to end to end child adversity, as well as what you what you all are doing as well. Not good. We're all at ground zero. Um, and I'll just go through this really quickly. Aces without intervention predict the following adverse health outcomes, and of course social outcomes like homelessness, addiction, um, prison. Um, three or with three or more aces, a sixty percent increase risk of autoimmune diseases, lupus, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, type one diabetes. Four or more ACEs, 2.5 times more likely to be diagnosed with cancer or lung disease, 4.5 times more likely to face depression and Alzheimer's, seven times more likely to go to prison, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, a huge increase in becoming a victim of opioid abuse. Uh, five or more ACEs, eight more times likely to become an alcoholic, and six or more ACEs shortens your lifespan by 20 years if you don't address your trauma. So hopefully all of you are addressing it. Um, you know, somatic healing, breathing, yoga, uh, self-care. Um, okay, hold on. There's all these questions coming in on my phone. Um, do inmates in Florida have a program opportunity or resource to become trauma-informed while incarcerated? Um, so I don't know about Florida. I know I'm, I'm pen pals with one Florida person. Uh, they don't, that person does not have the opportunity to become trauma informed. I know there's some, there's some good programs in Florida, but you know, the thing is we change the system when we decide the system's going to change. And so, um, you know, this has to become a political discussion as well as a, um, a social discussion, you know, we're all social workers basically here, right? Or nurses or advocates or whatever we are. Um, but we also need, we need help from, from the capital. So, um, but if you, if you take our program, we have a program that helps the men become, men and women become trauma informed. Um, next slide. So we, we surveyed over 3000 men and women throughout the United States. And um, in the US, 64% of the population has at least one adverse childhood experience. 
in prison, that survey is 98%. And as if we if we account racism and other other um, other ACEs, that number goes up to 100% of people have adverse have childhood trauma. Uh, in the U.S., 15% have four or more ACEs. In prison, that's 79% of the men and women we um, we surveyed. But I've done circles where basically it's you know I ask everyone to hold up their hands, and it's six or more every single one. And it's it's this is this was in the prison where um, we just were. We did a film for veterans, incarcerated veterans. You'll see a picture in in a minute. Um, but veterans have veterans have the trifecta of trauma. I'll get into that in a second. Um, oh, and so, and 64% of the men and women we surveyed have six or more ACEs. So that's what we're dealing with, like high amount of ACEs. And then, you know, we also, you know, I just think about, you know, you're African-American and you're, and you're poor, right? Um, you're being judged for your color. And then, you know, you, you can't get a job because you're, you have you have a racist you live in a racist county or whatever is the problem racist actually racist nation um that stress just those that amount of stress impacts your health in so many more ways and so i mean you know the call for self-care you know and being traumatized here's the thing for people that are traumatized we have no one who's ever modeled what self-care like looks like my husband takes breaks all day long i'm like what the hell is he doing he's just the lazy He's lazy, but no, he's taking care of himself. And so now I'm looking at him, I'm like, oh, I should go take a break, what a concept. Um, but you see, I'm busy doing, I'm busy trying to prove to the world that I have value because I didn't get that as a child. And so, and so I don't know how to get off, I don't even know how to get off it, get off the, the roller coaster, but at least I'm aware, right? That's the, the only way we can change anything is through awareness. So I just wanna take a moment to talk about solitary. So solitary is, is neglect, it is uh, overall neglect. It's the prison's version of neglect and they call it solitary is the prison's prison, right? But what we're doing is um, you put, you neglect somebody and they're left to their own devices. So, you know, you know, you have like, a, you, you talk to your girlfriend, you say, you know, maybe I sh should I go out with that guy? And she's, your girlfriend says, absolutely not. He's an asshole, excuse my language. Um, but if you were in solitary or if you were by yourself, you might do that because you don't have anything, anyone to bounce things off of. And I guess that's a bad example because you wouldn't be dating someone in solitary. But being alone, isolation is the worst thing for our brains. Our brains are wired for connection. And you know, COVID was devastating to all of us. And it's really incumbent upon us to start making those, go out and have coffee with your friends. I'm not gonna say drinks because I don't think we should be drinking anymore. I don't think it's good for us, but no judgment. I like a glass of wine once in a while. Um, Sorry, but so this is Rick Ramish. He's in Colorado and they got rid of long-term solitary. He says solitary is overused, misused and abused. And when he, when he um, ended solid long-term solitary, which is more than 14 days, they cite an 80% reduction in violence in, in those buildings. Um, the mental effects of solitary, anxiety and stress, depression and hopelessness. I think we use that slide again. I, Sorry, we double slided. Panic attacks worse than pre-existing. Mental issues, hypersensitivity to sounds and smells, problems with attention, concentration, and memory. Hallucinations that affect all of these senses. Paranoia, poor impulse control, social withdrawal, outbursts of violence, psychosis, fear of death, self-harm, suicide. But these are all things that isolation does to us anyway, right? So when we neglect our children, when we put children in orphanages. Um, and we don't give them the serve and return, serve and return. That's what we need, you know, serve and return. The baby says goo and the mother says, yes, honey, that's a tree. That children is learning that he matters, that he's making a good observation. His mother cares for him and it builds his empathy and all that in yes, honey. And that's what we all need. And that's what we need for each other, serve and return. If we can just give each other some love, appreciation and you know, just give it away. You know, we don't have to earn people's, like stop making people earn our love. Just like, just give it away now. We just love them, just love them, love them all. That's what we're here for. We're here to remember who we are, which is divine humans filled with love and joy, if you ask me. And then the physical effects. So this, by the way, 
is a way for you to um, to have a group session in in uh, so in solitary. So these guys are they're having a group session, but at least they're getting to talk. I mean, it's barbaric, yes, but at least they're begin they're getting to talk. Um, these are our humans that we're doing this to. These are the people, these are sons, these are fathers, these are cousins, and these are people with great ideas. And, and they know how to heal our, they know how to heal our neighborhoods. So, you know, we're our greatest assets, we're keeping our greatest assets um, from us. Um, so physical effects, chronic headaches, eyesight deterioration, you can't see the horizon physically and uh, uh, literally and figuratively. Digestive problems, dizziness, excessive sweating, fatigue, lethargy, urinary problems, heart palpitations, sensitivity to light and noise, loss of appetite, muscle and joint pain, sleep problems, trembling hands, weight loss. Um, and so now to the other side of the bars, did you know that the life expectancy of a correctional officer is 59 years old? So I'm 60, right? I'm just getting started. Like we are on, we are on the road and we are going somewhere. These guys, they might be dying right now. And um, to me, on my watch, not okay. These are humans, these are divine humans, right? We wanna, we wanna, we wanna hate the people living in prison. We wanna hate the people working in prison because they're they're jerks too, right? No, 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 no. So I just got invited today to do a circle with correctional officers. We're gonna do. Um, I'm not telling you where because this is top secret, but we're going to do um, childhood trauma, but we're also going to do what I call, I call them a the APE score, adverse prison experiences that I created. So we're going to have men and women that work in prison step inside the circle. Like, have you been, have you been, you know, verbally humiliated or assaulted? Have you been, have you witnessed an assault? Have you been assaulted? So they're going to be stepping inside the circle. And so they're going to get to see, because here's the thing, this is the thing about prison and PTSD. You can't talk about it. You know, it's suck it up, buttercup. That's one of the, the codes of the warrior. By the way, everybody in prison is a warrior. The gang members are warriors and the officers are warriors. These are all, they're all warriors sworn to a, a um, sworn to something bigger than themselves, you know, with the gangs, it's, you know, we got to kill the enemy, the enemy. And it's same thing with the officers. So the warrior code though is, is we have to suck it up. We have to, we have to take one for the team, but this take one for the team is what's creating, they have no way to discharge all of their trauma. And so the circle is, is my sneaky way to get them to talk about it without having to use words. And it's the same thing, which is why it's so so powerful in prisons that that circle is they get to they get to tell their story without saying a word. And what happens is they all realize they all have the same story and they're all they all have the same pain. And we see transformation in two to three hours. So now we get to do we get to do the officers. And I I didn't, you know, until I did the military circle, I didn't know we could do the officer circle. And it all, you know, the, the universe has a way of just orchestrating things in, in, in this magical way. So you guys are on the front lines knowing about this. And I just, we're thrilled. The whole, we're all so thrilled because this is the key. This is the key to the kingdom. When we get the officers to realize what they're, that dehumanizing them, each other, uh, dehumanizing the incarcerated men and women is dehumanizing themselves, the whole thing's gonna shift. They don't even realize what they're doing to themselves. That's what war does. You dehumanize another person. That's what they do in military training. They dehumanize you so you can dehumanize. And that's what childhood trauma does. It dehumanizes you, you dehumanize when you commit crimes. So it's all the same thing. Violence does the same thing. And it allowed me to dehumanize my son and my husband and my friends and you know some of our ex-presidents. And the contributing factors to this life expectancy drop is uh, PTSD, trauma, and stress. It's reported 35% of COs Trumps, suffer from PTSD. That number is really 80, 90, 100%. A 2001 survey of correctional staff showed staggering rates of depression, feelings of hopelessness, and thoughts of suicide, just like the men and women living in prison. 
25% of correctional officers reported feeling a lack of emotional responsiveness, being numb, trauma response. 20% reported inability to find pleasure in anything, trauma response. 13% reported hopelessness and or worthlessness, trauma response. I mean, imagine you're dehumanizing somebody, of course you feel dehumanized. It reported having no energy or being excessively tired, 49%. 44% reported frequent headaches, 12% having monthly migraines. Yeah, so, um, and I just, this was from a presentation that we did in Scotland. So we have a, a Scottish officer, but I saw this card and I thought, oh, I'm gonna bring it in. Um, so just look at the parallels, 98% of incarcerated wit have witnessed or been involved with vi in violence si situations. Officers, 73% have seen someone seriously hurt or killed while on the job. Um, with prisoners, with incarcerated men, die by suicide at the rate of 3.5 times the national average and with officers 2.5 times. Um, with incarcerated men lose approximately two years of life for each year confined, life expectancy 59 years old. 60% of incarcerated men and women 60% experience moderated to severe symptoms of PTSD. And then here's 34%, but you know that's baloney. But that's five times the national rate. And then moral injury. So I wanna talk about moral injury. When you see or do something that goes against your moral fiber, which is, this is basically a war, a, a symptom of war. Um, but it's, it's also a symptom of watching domestic violence. This is a symptom, this is what happens is we become numb, we become, desensitized to being alive. And that's, to me, that moral injury is the greatest injury. So the solution, ah, let's all take a deep breath. Ah, so this is what we're doing at Compassion, uh, Compassion Prison Project, our trauma to transformation workshop. So that's our one day workshop where we do step inside the circle. Let me go to the next page because it has it. So look at them, look at these guys. These are, we call them, this is the star, starfish crew because they're, they're doing a camp song here. And we, we have them, um, we do this called, a thing called the banana dance and it's form, banana, form, form, banana, form, banana, form, form, banana. So everybody doing this, peel, banana, peel, peel, banana, peel, banana, peel, peel, banana. And then I go nuts and I go, go, bananas go go bananas and then so everybody's like what the hell is she doing but then they're like okay we're gonna go bananas and then next thing you know the whole gym or wherever we are they're just it's erupted into joy and then at the at the end after so we've got that cadence going i go you're amazing you're you're amazing i'm amazing so they get to talk about themselves i'm i'm amazing and then then we go we're amazing and we do that with brilliance and incredible and a miracle so they get a real sense that one they are joy but two that they can create they then i go around like i did with step inside the circle i said what's the feeling here and they say joy you know freedom love and so they get to understand and this most of these guys have never been to camp have never had this kind of joy and they get to create this together and that's what they learn that's what they learn um, is that they're so powerful and so magnificent. Uh, we go through the symptoms of PTSD, uh, brain science. We teach them about brain science. Um, we talk, teach them about autom ants, automatic negative thinking. Um, I like to think of, I sometimes call prisons automatic negative think tanks um, and their limiting beliefs. We talk about discussions of childhood trauma and, and criminal behavior, self-forgiveness and personal empowerment movement and dance and healing modalities. And so far, 100% of the participants report some, experiencing some form of transformation by the end of the day. Next is our Trauma Talks curriculum, 16 part workbook and video curriculum. Um, you know, it's all trauma informed. And we did, we just finished a six week uh, version of it in New Zealand. And the guys there are like, we need more but this is the best thing we've ever had, the best program we've ever had. And um, one of the guys is so in love with it, he wants to become a facilitator and take it to everybody in prison, but also to his community. Um, and I, I, I part, visited their, their, their um, session one day and the guys were like, yeah, and I'm a, we're not gonna have any more aces in my, in my household. So 
this is what trauma awareness does. And it's, it's fast, it's fast and it's working. Um, so, you know, all of this written exercises for emotional healing, brain exercises to rewire neural pathways. How am I doing for time? Oh, shoot. I'm almost out. I'm out of time. All right. Well, anyway, you see this slide. There's lots of stuff. I'll keep going. Gosh, sorry about that. Um, so this is Nadine Burke Harris, and uh, she visited us. She's a, she was the former Sur Surgeon General of California. She visited us at Valley State Prison to talk to the men and to you know endorse the work that we're doing. She says prisons are an ICU, an intensive care unit for trauma. Um, told you I talk a lot, and and so this is the curriculum. You know these are our what is trauma? ACEs, symptoms of trauma, wisdom of trauma, the film wisdom of trauma, developmental trauma, attachment theory, traumatic brain injury, violence, accountability versus shame, restorative justice, vulnerability, forgiveness, resilience, being the change, giving back, transformation, and wrap up. That's what's in that. That should have been the other way. And then we're doing our training. Um, training focuses on education about the impact of trauma and mental, physical, and emotional health, provides training as to how to create an environment based on safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, and empowerment also from that's all SAMHSA. It also introduces and teaches a number of health and well-being models and strategies to the staff so they can learn about self-care. Um, and then here's, this is, a, this is a shot of our drone. We had a drone on the prison yard. Um, these are all veterans doing their flag ceremony. And I didn't know the flag ceremony was really important, um, but this was one of the most powerful days of my life actually two days, but the one day with, with Rodney, who Rodney, who couldn't forgive himself for the crime he committed. And um, I said to Rodney, I said, you know, you're holding all of us back by not forgiving yourself. You're holding us back. And, you know, as a warrior, he's a warrior. That's unacceptable. You can't hold your brothers back. So those were the words that helped transform him. But remember, our military, not only most of them have had childhood trauma because they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been attracted to the military, that violent that violent uh, situation. So they've had military trauma, childhood trauma, and prison trauma, the trifecta of PTSD and mental health issues. Um, we're thinking of calling this film, um, uh, what is it? Um, Operation, wait. Oh shoot, I forgot it. Operation Healing or no, uh, Mission Healing or something about like that. Oh, healing ups. There, there it is. Healing ups. Okay. And this is our, I don't know what happened to this slide. This is what, this is weird. Things are weird. Sorry. Wait. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. In cell transformation we're doing. So I'm based on that day in the prison. Um, we're creating an eight, eight hour. Uh, we can't do the, the full trauma because trauma needs to met, be metabolized in a group, but and we're going to give them some information to get them on the right track and just, let them forgive themselves and start thinking about uh, possibilities for their lives instead of violence and destroying. Um, and our podcast, please listen to my podcast, um, Compassion in Action. Um, I just got to, I just interviewed Michael Singer, who lives in Florida. He's a Florida resident and um, James Gordon. Those are coming out soon, but it's just with all the top. Oh, let's go to the next page so you can see all these people are, are in, are some of the people I've interviewed. Um, Chris Wilson, these returning citizens are our favorites of the guys in, we, we're, we're sending, oh, Eldra too, um, of the guys in prison. So they're getting to really see how to, how to get out of prison. Um, some closing thoughts. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. Trauma is a fact of life. It does not, however, have to be a life sentence. And unexpected kindness is the most powerful, least costly, and most underrated agent of human change. So we did it. We did it. Sorry, I went a little long, but I think we still have a little bit of time for questions. Is that right? We have plenty of time for questions. And I have 100 million questions. So I, let me start with a question that I have um, as people start you know, throwing their questions. So I am what I call consider a community-based clinical scholar, right? So community engagement is the, at the core of the research that I do, the practice that I do. So all these wonderful things that you're doing, are you collaborating with researchers to make sure these things, they are evaluated, then replicated, published, shared with individuals so we could make them evidence-based practice? 
Uh, I'm going to not Notre Dame next next Thursday to be in my first conference with Leo. If they're there, we're gonna we're getting together our first uh, um, evidence base. No, what is it? What's it? You know, when you have this control group, and we're doing that. So okay. it's, it's happening. Random, randomized trial. Thank you. Random, that R word, I keep forgetting, but randomized trial. Yeah, so we're, we're yeah, they, they love what we're doing. But yes, but if you have any thoughts, you know, we're here. We're, I we're almost open. have thoughts, maybe too much for my own good, but absolutely. I think it's, it's extremely valuable for the work that we're doing in the grassroots, which is really where, you know, all the work is being done. But sometimes, and I, I include myself, the researchers are not connected to it, and then we're not able to bring and disseminate it, you know, nationally or, or globally. Um, so another question, you, I, I love the concept of the also doing the talking circle with the correctional officers, because to me, that goes to the conversation about, you know, how we have parent caregiver support, so they know how to deal with their own traumas in order to take care of and prevent traumas in their children. So in a way, I see um, the correctional officers doing the same thing. If they don't know, right, they are living their own trauma. And in this environment, it is a traumatic environment. They see things and they can also, you know, relive those things and, and kind of project it to the inmates in there. So what are you seeing, you know, how did that come about and what did you see beyond this, just the initial talking circle? Well, and it's, it's also a trauma circle, but um, the thing about prison, it's again, where it's the warrior class, right? Both, everybody's a warrior and respect is the most important, is the most important currency there. And the minute, the minute respect is, is denied, like, um, I heard of an assault the other day, uh, an officer got assaulted. Um, uh, someone, someone, he had a dirty urine test. And so they took away his family visits. And so the, the, the incarcerated guy went to the officer and um, tried to flee his case. And the officer said, no, this is the rule. Um, so then that, that guy assaulted the officer, right? So, whether or not that officer, you know, he's just pit, pit doing his job, but also there's no respect, right? Like he was not respected as a human being. And that's where we have to start. You know, we can't have, first of all, family visits should not be negotiable. That is our lifeline to hope and to tra transformation. But the other thing is the culture of respect has to be mandated. There has to be, look, I understand and who they are not the judge. The officers are not the judge. We've are, those men have already been judged. So they need to be. Their job is to actually return them in better shape because that's creates humans. That's public safety. And if you destroy them, if you continue to destroy them, then you're going to destroy someone else's life. So um, there has to be accountability in the prison system as well. Anyway, but I'm not going to be vicious like that. I'm going to be like, oh, you're traumatized. Let's talk about what that happens and why are you sitting at the back of the restaurant like all of the other officers, but also to honor them, they're first responders. And they're not, you know, I'm having, I'm having the incarcerated men say, thank you for your service, sir, to the officers, and which is dis disarming. They're, the, the officers are like, what the hell? Um, but we, I am going to in, infuse a culture of respect in there so that we see the humanity and so that humanity exists in prisons and that's so that's <coughs> but that's been my plan all along because when i saw this thing this officer thing it's like this is this is bullwhack <coughs> excuse me i think someone said do we know the uh, percentage of foster care i think it's 80 percent um, that end up in the prison system i think it's about 80 percent um, but, but if I'm wrong, don't, don't quote me. <laughs> no problem. Um, so one question that someone asked, and I'm going to piggyback on that question. The question is, um, how do we build a trauma informed systems at all levels? And for me, when you were presenting, you, you start in this, you know, circle of trauma 
and that's a, a, a day or two kind of process. While you in there, do those who identify as high trauma experiences, like, you know, above six, is there services provided in, for those individuals? And, and then is there a way, some connections to trauma-informed care after discharge? So again, how do you create a community and continuum of care for trauma-informed care? Well, right now we're just, people don't even know they're traumatized. So that's, I, you're right. Continuum of care is, is, would be amazing, but we need millions of dollars for continuum of care. Right now, my job is just to, so everybody knows they're traumatized. That's, if I can do that in the next three years, to me, that's trauma informed. That isn't trauma responsive. It's not all those other trauma, trauma babas, but people at least will know, and they'll start being aware of their behavior. Which will which will get that first shift, but um, but we actually just hired one of the guys that's in the film. He's out now, and we just hired him to be our returning citizen um, uh, coordinator. And so we hope to have people when they come out have that have been through the program connect with us and and get some get some at least a place where they can land. Um, but, you know, we have a staff of nine right now and we're just, you know, you know, I'm here putting labels on DVDs while I'm, you know, doing, you know, it's like, a, and I shouldn't be doing it, but it's got to get done. <laughs> so, you know what that's like. Um, yeah. <laughs> One more, another question. Um, we have time for a few more. So when children are small, we punish and isolate them when they are so little. Um, they go to the corner, time out, we suspend them or kick them out from school. Then it goes on and on and on the pipeline to this, con this disconnection in prison. So how can we change that, you know, conversation or that behavior um, in the different systems? Yeah, I, I mean, this, this, so we got teachers that are traumatized, right? And they don't want to deal with this. So like, I'm not, I'm not, not blaming them. I, when I'm traumatized, I don't want to deal with a, a cranky kid. So yeah, and same with the people in prison, right? They don't want to deal with it. Um, an incarcerated guy who's going off about the injustices or whatever. Um, but the thing is, we have to like take a deep breath and talk to them. That's what we have to do. It's we can no longer we can no longer put people in corners. You know, we can't punish them. We have to treat them as humans. And this is also a signal that something's going on at home, right? A child acting out is, is signaling to us that there's a problem, but now we can't get child protective services to, you know, that's that whole issue too. We don't want that, but parents need to be educated about what trauma does to their children's brains. Um, you know, to live, in, to live in fear that you're gonna be, that you're in danger creates toxic stress. If it's, if it, if, if you don't get to discharge it and, you know, relax. And that's what we, that's what we have. We have people that are, that are so stressed out. They can't, they can't get a job. They can't find work. They can't, they're just so friggin' stressed out. And then bootstraps. Are you kidding me? Again, I'm not going to say it out, outside of this, this seminar because that's going to turn them off and then they'll double down. They'll double down. That's the thing. That's what happened with slavery. The more we, the more we attack the South for what they've done, the more they're going to double down and be cruel and vicious. But if we say, "Look, man, let's figure something out," then then you're human. You've humanized them. Then we can have a conversation. But if you dehumanize them, they they got all the tools to dehumanize again. So that's how we change the world. Here is we stop attacking. We start in integrating and and ad and adoring our uh, the person that we are abhor that that we find abhorrent it's you know there's a lot of child abusers that i've been working with to me this is like the crime of of the crime but they're going to go home one day so if they're not in good shape if they don't feel human if they don't feel human they're going to continue so it's my job to make sure, and it should be every person in the prison's job to make sure those men are in great shape going home, mm -hmm. not marginally, not, you know, maybe they can go home. No, they got to be in like, yes, um, we've got this 
right now what we're doing in California is we're creating a, an anthology called Messages to the Youth so that everyone in California has a chance to participate in California prison to send a message to the youth so that they don't end up in prison. And it's giving everybody a purpose and a, like, wait a second, I could change somebody's life, right? That's how you get them ready by giving them purpose and direction, get it, get their GEDs, get their, their college degrees, get, you know, have them make a difference while they're sitting there in their cells. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I have, this is going to be like the last question was going to be a loaded combined question. Okay. So this, let's do it. a combination of a question from Maggie, which I really, really love. Um, and she's asking, uh, are you getting uh, to do this with people in men and women if, uh, in prison, regardless of the language barriers? Someone who speaks Spanish as a first language, I'm still trying to learn English. You know, I think that's a very important in given the diversity of our, our nation, how it's growing, um, multiple languages. And, and if so, how are you doing? And if not, what are the challenges? What are you seeing? Um, you know, and, and also trying to create this a little bit more with jail staff as well, are they being trained besides just doing the trauma circle? Well, uh, yeah, we, so I'll do the jail staff first, but well, I'll, I'll do, I'll do the span. Yes. Yeah, so we have started translating our curriculum. Um, when there are Spanish speaking people that come to the event, we pair them with a translator. So they'll, they will you know, things I say, One uh, ideally one day I will train somebody who could speak Spanish, who can give this whole, the whole day in Spanish. Um, but yeah, and then that, that's not the only language, you know, we have other languages that need, this needs to go worldwide. So yes, so to the ver to the millionaires that are listening to this, if, if you, after you've given to the Center for Child Counseling, we need a million dollars as well so that we can, we just need money. We just, we'll, we'll spend it really well, but we need it because, um, because it's working, it's really working. Um, but the other part of, so the staff, uh, we just finished um, an eight week curriculum that we, we tried out in New Zealand. I don't know why New Zealand's getting all the attention, but we did it in New Zealand, the staff loved it. Now remember the staff in New Zealand, they're already humanistic. They're already seeing the people in prison as need as humans and needing help. So we don't have that um, we don't have that uh, that barrier to deal with. But they found it really valuable, and um, and so we're we're modifying it for 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 the U.S. and we hope to roll that out soon. Um, but this, you know, I think in May I'll be going to this prison to do the the first circle with the officers, and. Um, it's, it's, this could be like the breaking point. This could be the moment that the floodwaters of change come because once they realize that they're human, that the, that everybody's human in a prison and that we can no longer do what we've been told, uh, they're gonna ask for changes in, and I'm gonna talk to them about this, is some of these rules are ridiculous and we've got to, we've got to stand up to these arbitrary rules that destroy people's lives, literally destroy their lives like solitary. Um, oh, different, don't, don't put, don't do that email. Do it Fritzy at Compassion Prison Project. Project.org. Yes, um, but I really loved your audience. I could feel you guys listening and really absorbing um, everything. I think um, I have a few quotes I wanna leave you all with. Um, the, one of the favorite quotes that I, I give to the guys, where did it go? Shoot, come on. See, I get all, oh, here it is. Um, it's from Dead Prez. They said, the caterpillar don't care what you think about him. He was born to be fly. So we say that one and they love that one, but um, there's, it's, there's two more. Well, there's three more, sorry. Um, Mother Teresa says, if there is no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. Um, David Hawkins, he says, be kind and forgiving to everything and everyone, including yourself at all times without exception. I'm gonna say that one again, because it's so important because we're so not kind to ourselves and we're so not kind to each other and we do it because we're traumatized we do it because that's how we've been taught and we just have to question that 
and just know that this is this is just not who we are. We're divine humans. Be kind and forgiving to everything and everyone, including yourself at all times, without exception. And the last quote is from Ron Das, and it is, whew, we're all just here to walk each other home. And so, you know, let's walk those officers home. Let's walk those incarcerated men and women home. Let's walk those starving children home. Let's walk those stressed out parents home. Let's walk each other home and make this a place that's, that's livable, equitable, and, and joyful. Thank you so much, Fritzi, for not only, you know, this wonderful project, but your heart. Um, I think that that's the one thing that set individuals to do this for a living, and when you do it from your heart, because our very traumatized population feel our energy, our authenticity, and that's how they begin to open up, and that's how healing starts. So thank you so much. I am a life learner, and I learned so much today. Um, and and yeah, I just appreciate. It. And again, if anything I could do, um, believe me, research. I am here because this goes right to the core of you know what Center for Child Counseling does and what I do. So anything that we could do to help, please just let us know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Wow. Um, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely touched. And, and I, I love moments like this because it just brings back home all the work that we do. And but most importantly as well, that we have to have self-care because the work that we do is important, but it cannot be done if we don't take care of ourselves as well. So um, as we are closing out another wonderful, compassionate, lead the fight event, we would like to thank everyone in attendance for actively being part of the AC Solutions. And we particularly appreciate our dedicated sponsors and donors who made this event series possible and happen. We are especially grateful today for the time and vision of our featured speaker, Fritzi Hoffman, for significantly moving this work forward on behalf of imprisoned people and anyone with an AIDS story. Of those of us seeking um, healing for ourselves and others, we believe in a vision where children grow in a safe and assuring homes and communities, and we'll stop at nothing to stand up for the whole health of our children and their future. We, and every Lead the Fight event, when, when, uh, when an urgent call and rally for doing something, not just saying something. Here's your personal call to action to give children with trauma the safety and healing they deserve. The time for compassion and action is now. While our children are most vulnerable before violence and trauma ends in poor mental health, substance use, instability, and incarceration, please choose the way you will do your part. You could do it through training, be ACE aware and informed, sign your place of employment or organization up for an intensive um, experience and training that will empower you to be a positive force in addressing childhood trauma and community adversity. You could also do it through economics, be a business leader who boldly invests in early childhood development to grow a future thriving economy with brilliant minds to lead it. Through advocacy, Back, back up policy that supports the safety of children and encourage your friends and families and colleagues at work to be ACE aware. Train and offer safety and support to children experiencing adversity. Through giving, support the series with your gift, funding, and lead the fight gives back to educating and training many more people. We need them. We need professionals. We need parents anyone who wants to be part of preventing childhood trauma. You may give with our QR code on the screen. You can also give online at any time. To engage with this powerful course or any other personal um, course at a personal level, join the new Center for Child Counseling Collective Giving Circle. Once again, those action items are training, economic, advocacy, and giving. We thank you for your generosity and commitment to, to, to this, lead this fight. Thank you so much for all your assistance.